that we won't have a clipboard. I have a little no, clapboard won't. this time, but I'll just go over the and opening. Go ahead. I'm rolling and okay. Today is Friday, August 31. I'm H.F. Williamson. I'm interviewing Ralph Langenheim for the second day. This is for the Veterans History Project of the Library of Congress American Folklife Center. We are at Studio X, Campbell Hall, Urbana, Illinois. Henry Radcliffe is the Director of Lighting, Sound, and Camera. Ralph, why don't you begin? Okay, well, uh, when we left off, I managed to get the LCIL 551 to Charleston, South Carolina for refitting. But if, unfortunately, my memory isn't perfect, and I don't always have my wits about me, and I'm doing this ad hoc. So I skipped over some things in Italy and in North Africa, human interest type stuff, that I'd like to double back and pick Fine. up. Fine. As you may remember, uh, we carried troops from Naples up to Livorno, Leghorn, in 200 man batches in LCIs. They took them off the transports that had brought them from the United States and Brazil and elsewhere, rather than risk those large ships that close to the, the front line. And we carried uh, two loads of Brazilians, the Brazilian Expeditionary Force. We carried a group of Italians who had formed up into, been formed up into labor battalions in, in the Italian army, which at that point was supporting the Allies. And we also carried Let's see, Brazilians, Italians. An American division, as I remember, uh, the 95th, was it? Or? Oh, yes, the, the 96th Division, which was, was the African-American Infantry Division, which is so big in the news these days. It was a very large unit, and it went into the lines. So anyway, uh, when they pulled the 45th Division and the 32nd, 36th Division out of the line, uh, they fought all the way up, England, up, up the uh, spine of Italy, they replaced them with, with these untested troops, the Brazilians and, and the 96th, and we took them up there, some of them. Uh, they were a different group of people, certainly. Uh, as a person who had been raised in Oklahoma in a segregated school system and all that, it was one of my first experiences with uh, African Americans who hadn't, hadn't been involved in, you know, hadn't been sort of suppressed. And I had to deal with, with, the, with the troop officer, who I found to be a very edgy and aggressive person. I realize now why he was. But I had a real confrontation with him. He wanted me to bet on Army and the Army-Navy game, which was being played that day. And I don't bet. And I was <laughs> trying to tell him I didn't want to bet. And that was a real, real tussle with that guy. Huh. And another thing that happened with those, we, we had all kinds of problems. But uh, when we loaded that company up, and took them, took them out and anchored for the night before we went out over the, the next morning. A couple of them apparently jumped overboard and swam ashore and left behind their weapons. So we inherited a couple of M1 Garands. We tried to offer them to the commanding officer. He said, I don't need them. I don't have anybody to carry them. <laughs> and it t really turned out that they weren't wanted because they were, they were jammed and so on and had not been very well cared for. But anyway, that was that experience. Now, the Brazilians, on the other hand, Getulio Vargas, the dictator of Brazil, was trying to get Brazil its stripes as a major power, so he almost insisted on sending troops to uh, Europe for the, the war. And so the Brazilian Expeditionary Force was the result. This was another experience for me in that I hadn't dealt with Latin Americans in quite such bulk. And so when the troop officer on the first group peeled off his watch and gave it to me <laughs> in a typical social thing for in that culture, I was somewhat taken aback, and I didn't have anything to give him back. I know I was embarrassed by that. And another thing that happened with the Brazilians, one of the loads, we got up to up to Livorno, and we were ready to unload, and their medic, medical officer came up, and he says, we have to wait. Uh, we may be quarantined. And he, was, he had very poor English, and my high school Spanish didn't pass for Portuguese, so we had trouble communicating. He says, one of our men has the Kashumba. <laughs> Kashumba? What's Kashumba? <laughs> I questioned him about it. Finally, finally he, he forced himself to, to give, give an English. He says, Mumpus. So we were about to be quarantined in Leghorn, Italy with 200 Bra Brazilian soldiers with mumps aboard. <laughs> I'd never had mumps. I didn't look forward to that. 
But it was resolved and they did go ashore. Now, let's see. Uh, other things that happened in Potsawali, the that fourth officer, the, the uh, drama guy, Rip Colbert, they call him, uh, cooked up a, a, a scam on, on, on our captain, hired a teenage prostitute to come down to the... Now, is uh, this the same captain you started this with? This was Boswell, no, the replacement captain, okay. the, the, the Mormon deacon, bishop, excuse me, uh, to embarrass him, come down to the come down to the ship and announce herself as having been reserved or called for by the captain, Oops. and so this, this lady undulated down to the dock and s stood there uh, flipping grapes in the air and catching them in her mouth and <laughs> asking for Capitan, Capitan, you sent for me. <laughs> and poor old Buzzy turned several shades of red before that lady finally left. But we had a lot of lighthearted moments on board the ship as well as the not so lighthearted. And then uh, the captain, the uh, fourth officer that had tuberculosis, uh, we lost him in Naples. The pharmacist mate, the, or conscientious Marzalek, uh, had been trying to get this guy into, into a naval hospital from the time we got to Europe. And finally, he just threw up his hands one day and, and grabbed. O'Brien, and they hitchhiked into the Naval Hospital in Naples, which was quite a distance away. And he finally got him in front of an x-ray camera, and they wouldn't let him come back. So we had to ship his gear to him. But that's when O'Brien left the ship, and, and this, this fellow, Colbert, came aboard. Down in Bizerte, there were a couple of interesting things, which is minor, really. Buswell and I uh, went ashore on shore leave, and just wandered around town, and we walked, wandered into the marketplace, the souk, and it was just like the Arabian Nights. I mean, there were guys in long robes and and uh, Arab head, headdress, long beards, sitting playing playing chess at tables, and and all the sights and sounds and smells of, of that marketplace. And we enjoyed it tremendously until the MPs came and scooped us up. It was off limits, and we knew it was off limits. <laughs> anyway, they popped us into a jeep and hauled us away. Another shore leave there, we, we contracted for a meal in a private home, French colonial people in, in uh, Bizerte who were interested in making a few, few dollars. Rather simple meal in a concrete block and stucco house with very Mediterranean, very different. So those are a few things that happened there. But to get back to, uh, to uh, Charleston, they gutted the ship and, and rebuilt the insides of it and, and took uh, half of our crew away, including this Colbert fellow, and a new gang of people came on board. So we half crew were old-timers and half of them were brand new. We went through some rudimentary training and then started off for the, for the Pacific coast, going down the coastline and up out along the Keys in Florida. And by this time, the Atlantic was secure, so they turned on the, the, the lights, uh, the lighthouses were operating, and, and the ships had their navigational lights. And one memory is swinging down from lighthouse to lighthouse on oh, the coast of Florida. Yeah. You, as one was fading into the distance, you'd pick up the next one, and you'd do your piloting on those. A very pleasant cruise down to Key West, a little time in Key West, and then off across the, the Caribbean. We were still in convoy. It was a purely LCI convoy. There were no uh, escort vessels. And the navigation was being done by LCI officers, which led to a contremps when we arrived at the coast of Panama, when the convoy commodore signaled a course to port to, to get to the Panama Canal. And Buswell and some of the other captains, who also were doing their navigating, uh, had a different position, <laughs> quite a bit. Of, it was, the idea was we really had to turn right to the canal, and there was sort of a caucus of captains, and they overruled this guy, fortunately, because we did have to go to starboard to get into, into, uh, into the canal. Voyage across the Caribbean was also an, an, a new thing for us. It was, the weather was pretty calm, and it was warm, and there were flying fish and dolphins, quite a bit of life. Uh, every, every morning we'd have to sweep off a couple of flying fish that had not made a wet landing, and so on and so forth. 
It was very pleasant. And then on in through the canal, <coughs> down the other side, and out into the Pacific and up, up the coast, and that too was sort of different. Now on that side, we did go without our navigation lights and did have a, uh, an escort because there were Japanese submarines in the Pacific Ocean and theoretically we could have been attacked. But the interesting thing about the trip up the west coast of Central America is that we were going through a marine upwelling area where deep cold waters were current was coming impinging on the coast and then rising along that coastline bringing nutrients oh. and high organic content in the water and as a result uh, a lot of marine life dolphins all over the place and sailing for half a day in in a sea dotted with yellow sea turtle shells oh. scattered around and fishermen in small boats and at night those small boats all had lights and they bobbed up and down so you had flashing lights uh, more about that later on and on one occasion we had a, a, a giant ray come up right underneath us and, and broach in front of the ship the, huh. the wingspan of the thing was looked to be as wide as the ship wow. <laughs> and sharks and, and seabirds by the jillions and our crews depending upon the ship uh, behaved very badly. Uh, they used those turtles for target practice, and they shot at the shot at the seabirds and and just wanton slaughter of of marine life. Unfortunately, uh, Buswell had a had a conscience, and that was strictly forbidden on board our ship, as it was on board my gunboat when we were coming back south uh, later on in the war. When I did let a guy fire at a seabird, and I was sure he was going to miss, and by God, he hit him. Hmm. I'm still embarrassed by that. <laughs> but anyway, uh, we got up to San Diego and went into, into San Diego and went into a training mode. And about two weeks later, we had a couple of cases of venereal disease that had to go to the hospital. We had a good time in Panama on the way down. Coco Solo, we had shore leave there. Got into a bars which with uh, bar girls and right out of a B-grade movie. <laughs> <laughs> and this, this fellow Marzalek borrowed the Buswell's uniform and went ashore as an officer with oh. Buswell's <laughs> connivance. I learned that just a few years ago. So it was quite a, quite a story. But uh, training, we got a new officer, a fellow by the name of Alan Hamilton, replaced the, the fourth officer that we had picked up at, at uh, Charleston, the fourth officer, was one of the guys that went to the hospital and didn't come back. We never found out what he had, but we had our suspicions. But Alan Hamilton is the man who took the, the pictures, some of which you will be seeing, I suppose. And he took pictures on our trip up to Alaska, and I, I have a full set of those. He, uh, well, we did a number of things. One, of the, one, la one practice, practice landing situation out on one of the Channel Islands uh, we entangled the, the, the anchor cable in our screw, and had quite a quite a quite a quite a show with people trying to d get it cut off. We finally just had to cut it off. We weren't able to able to take care of that. Went back on one screw. Had to go into dry dock to get disentangled. Hitchhiked up to the lighthouse. Got on good stories. But basically, it was just training to get ready for going to uh, Asia, and we were all in some trepidation over that. But finally we got orders to proceed up to Alaska, where our ships were to be lend-leased to the Soviet Navy. Oh. So a, a group this of six... This was what date, approximately? Mm -hmm. what, what date was this? What date was this? Alaska? The, what uh, what month and, and year was this? When well, it was shortly before the end of the war because the, the war ended while I was on board transport coming back from that. Okay. So this was in 1946. And but you were training in the summer of 45 for the, uh, for the Asian theater? Yeah. Okay. 45 or 46, I'd have to check that. Uh, I've got it all in that book. That book's accurate because I, I, got, the, I got a hold of the ship's log, so there's a good timeline for it. But uh, anyway, 
uneventful voyage up to up to uh, Seattle and another yard availability. They cleaned us up and, like brand new, painted out the two French flags that we had painted on the conning tower in honor of our being in Normandy and southern France landing as soon as the as soon as the base authorities turned their backs, we painted them back on, and that's the way the Russians got that ship. <laughs> After all, they were buying a used car, <laughs> or getting a used car. And what did we do in Seattle? Well, usual leave-type stories, shore leave-type stories, not, nothing of any particular note. Finally, we took off for Alaska via the Inside Passage. And we took off in the afternoon and, s and sailed overnight up the inside of Vancouver Island and arrived at night the next day at, at the tip of Vancouver Island and anchored overnight. And from then on, we traveled in daylight only. So we went up the inside passage in daylight all the way. Miles and miles of tra traveling up narrow channels covered with trees, and here and there a clearing, an Indian village maybe, or a cannery or something like that. We saw the glow of Prince Rupert as we went, went by, and uh, finally up to catch a can, and shore leave there, went ashore with, uh, with our new engineering officer, who was a Mustang, by the way, an ex-enlisted man. Hmm. Drank a little bit too much and bought a wonderful Eskimo ivory, uh, item, a little goose on the way back to the ship. I never would have bought it if I'd been cold sober. I still have it, and it's one of my most cherished possessions. Sometimes poor judgment is good judgment. And on, on up, we knocked down a dock in, in one, of the, one of the places where we anchored for the night. Tide tried tying up to it. It was rickety, barren off hot springs. And finally came out, the, out into the Gulf of Alaska. And shortly, the radio man comes trundling up and he'd been listening to Tokyo Rose and Tokyo Rose had welcomed our six ships to the Gulf of Alaska citing the numbers. Oh my. So there must have been some Japanese coast washer, watcher or a submarine around that spotted us as we came out. It was a little bit disconcerting because we didn't have a, an armed escort. And then trundled on out to uh, Kodiak Island and rested a little bit there, got, got shore leave. Have a, had, Alan Hamilton and I had a wonderful hike up in the tundra on top of the island. He didn't find any bears, fortunately. And then uh, out along the Alaska Peninsula, past Pavlov Volcano, which is a very active volcano. It was puffing out a, a bit of smoke every, every 30, well, five minutes, 10 minutes. Sailed past that. One of the pictures that you see will be a, a, maybe a group of our, our ships going past Pavlov. <clears throat> and out to Cold Bay, Fort Randall, an army base had been put in when they were in for the Aleutians campaign and was still in use. Quonset huts on tundra, no trees, very bleak, very cold. And the Russians, we took aboard a Russian crew. The captain was a regular Russian naval officer, a graduate of their naval academy, but he was Mongolian. Hmm. It was a little bit of a shock. And at night on watch when you were with him, he would sing operatic arias. That's how he amused himself. <laughs> Very different. Uh, the Russians ran the ship differently. We had six machinists and one gunner's mate. They had five gunners mate and two machinists. Hmm. Uh, they didn't really treat the machinery with much respect. They'd up anchor and, and crank up full speed ahead from a dead, you know, dead standstill, just shaking the ship to pieces. We were, well, not quite to pieces, it didn't come apart, but we were sure that they would, would damage it. They would ram those beaches at full speed, and it was, since we weren't unloading anybody, it was chancy pulling off and so on but we had our had our time and they they bought all of our underwear hmm. they they were their, their underwear could have been made of canvas <laughs> they they bought they had had money and they bought all kinds of things but then it came time to transfer command and the first thing they did before we went up to make the actual transfers 
they brought up all the, all the ship's whiskey, and the five officers, ten officers, drank it all. So we were all tipsy when we went up to <laughs> up to go through the ceremony. And I called both crews to hand salute about four minutes early. I remember that. But anyway, then it was a Russian ship, and we all went back, and they went on to Vladivostok. Now stories came back. Uh, the story that came back was that they had run it on a rock on the way over. When they didn't. It got to Vladivostok. It did participate in carrying troops down to the Kurils when the Japanese uh, occupied the Kurils. And it ultimately was returned to the U.S. service and was, was stricken from the list like every other, L every other LCI by, by the Navy. And I don't know what happened to it after it was stricken from the list. Various things happened to LCIs when they were stricken from the list. Some of them ended up as, as uh, tour boats in New York Harbor mm. and were still in service at the time of 9-11. They'd been extensively remodeled. I know that because they, they were hauling refugees to the New Jersey shore after the bombing. Some of them, uh, two of them were bought by the CIA and participated in the Bay of Pigs landing. Uh, a bunch of them went to the French in Vietnam and were transferred to the Vietnamese Navy and were ultimately retrieved and ended up in the Philippine Navy. A bunch of them were given to the British and went to India and I don't know what happened to them. Some were given to Argentina, I don't know what happened to them. But most of them were junked and actually the engines were the valuable thing. They would jerk the engines, those GMC engines, and they ended up in the logging business and here, there, and elsewhere. And then the rest of them were scrapped for scrap iron. There are only two of them still left afloat that we know of, unless, unless the tour boats at, at, in New York Harbor have been replaced. But anyway, uh, it's, they're interesting stories as to what happened to those things, and we tried to track them down. I'm trying to write a little article about the Barbara J and Blagar, which are the two that were the command boats for the Bay of Pigs landing. But I can't find a lot of stuff. It's very difficult. Do you to want to say who we is, the what? group? Do you want to tell us who we is, the group that's doing this? You, there, is a, there is a group of LCI veterans that's, that meets regularly? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm writing an article for the LC item on that, that's, if I can yeah. get it all together. But that, that's the we is me. I'm interested oh. in, in the history of this. So anyhow, uh, I, can, I can find out that those things were bought by the CIA from, from a, a company that I can't identify, which may have been an offshoot of George Bush's Zapata offshore drilling people who were down there and may or may not have been mixed up in it. Uh, the Barbara J was not named after Barbara Bush. There's no J in her name, hmm. uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then they disappear after the landings. Let's see, we're, 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 we're about ready to come home from Alaska. Okay, so they put me on board. Uh, they flew us up to, up to uh, uh, Dutch Harbor, or Kodiak, rather, and put us put us on board a transport, and we were living in living in inside a transport with a bunch of LCI officers going back, and then I got 30 days leave, rode the train to Minneapolis to St. Des Moines, and from Des Moines to Kansas City, and from Kansas City <laughs> down to Tulsa. It was a long trip on trains in those days, mm -hmm. and enjoyed my my leave, and was posted to command of a ship in the Pacific Fleet, the LCIG-397, it's a gunboat, and was ordered to report to Okinawa to pick that ship up. So it was on the train out to, to uh, San Francisco to report to the Naval District there, housed in San Francisco until the transport was available and rode a transport to Okinawa. And, and was put on board the LCIG-397. The LCIG-397 was a member of, of the so-called Black Cat Flotilla, and I don't quite remember the number of it, which uh, is memorialized by its commanding officer, Rear Admiral Mar 
tomorrow, I believe it is. I have to check that out. We're beyond my book by now. Uh, anyhow, he, uh, Morrill was his name, he uh, he had been in command of a, of a, of a uh, minesweeper in Manala Bay at the time of, of uh, the war broke out. And when, the, when he was ordered to surrender, he didn't. Hmm. He gathered together a group of his crew members and, and they took a Liberty boat, which is about a 25 foot diesel launch, and proceeded to sail it to Darwin, Australia. Wow. So he escaped from the, from, and he, there's a couple of books about that. One by Morrill with somebody or other, and then a fictionalized version of it, which is pretty horrible, but it was quite, a, quite an extensive thing. And then he went, was offered anything he wanted in the way of posting. He said, I want to be in a place where I can kill Japanese. And they said, well, the amphibious force. So he took command of an amphibious force, an LCI flotilla, and uh, was responsible for a number of things. Apparently he was responsible for the fact that we were actually issued navigational equipment. And the notion was that the reserve officers would be so so limited in their capabilities that they, they could cross the ocean following somebody that was able to navigate. Well, we got our, we got our sextants and we did use them, and things of that sort. And he was in, they were involved in the landings on Guam, but most notably, they were the holding force at, at after the Peleliu. They were at Peleliu, and were also the holding force when the Japanese were just isolated up at the north end of that chain of islands. And they had really hairy time of it. And he wrote this thing up himself after he was 80, I guess, with the aid of his wife, I guess. Anyway, it's a it's a real fine book. It's a hard one to get a hold of. But he's never been written up as a World War II character. He was somebody who was not particularly enchanted with Halsey and the establishment and said so. Hmm. And he did great things. So somebody should, some 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 writer should pick that up and and put out a book on this guy. But anyway, I reported aboard. And these guys were all duly impressed by the fact that this man had been at Normandy, and I've told you about what happened to us at Normandy, like essentially nothing in the way of blood and guts and so on. Well, these, I was intimidated somewhat by taking over a crew that had been in, in several hotly contested landings and had suffered casualties and blah, 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 and had been through the typhoon and all of that. So there was a, a mutual respect and fear thing there. <laughs> anyway, I took command of that and brought it back all the way across the Pacific Ocean. Uh, lay two off of Saipan. We didn't go ashore. Had some time in, in at Pearl Harbor waiting there, f traveling in convoy. And finally got to San Diego and got orders for New Orleans. And I pumped that up with my crew. They were looking forward to having a decent shore leave, finally. <laughs> shore leave in, in, the, in the Pacific was they put you in a, a Higgins boat and took you over to a sandbar where they opened a keg of beer. <laughs> it was all guys and, and uh, didn't really serve the purpose. Well, it did. It served it, but not very well. So anyway, they were all, all set to go, except some of them had their numbers were coming up. We were losing crew members like flies, and something happened. Somebody dropped a wrench into the, the gears on one of the engines. Uh -oh. <laughs> we sort of thought maybe it was somebody whose numbers were due to come up while we would be en route to the Gulf Coast. But anyway, uh, with the connivance of those of us that wanted to go, uh, we fixed that. They, they wouldn't the Navy Yard wanted to just decommission us right there, and, but instead they issued us some grinding tools and we went to work and we fixed that, fixed that and, and went on around. So we went down the coast again through all, the, all of the, all of the uh, sea life and the, the turtles and so on and so forth. And we, this was a, My ship was a flagship. A little bit about that. I turned in my orders to the commanding officer of that, that flotilla in Okinawa. <laughs> Very formal naval occasion. He had diarrhea, and he was ensconced in the throne of China. <laughs> he, 
in shorts and no shirt. <laughs> I turned over my arms to take command of the ship. There was a fellow by the name of Edgar Lewis Yates. He was a, had been taken into the Navy from the Merchant Marine and reputedly had spent more time afloat than the shore all of his life. He was really a, a hard-nosed character. I established a pretty good relationship with him. For example, coming into, into Honolulu on the way back, I had the bridge and he was up there and there were some small boats at a dock alongside in the narrow channel and they were our wakes were just tossing them, you know, smashing them up. So I just ordered a decrease to one third speed without seeking authorization from the flotilla commander and he turned around and snapped at me, Why did you do that? Blah 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 and I told him why I did that and he said, Good. <laughs> <laughs> I mean he was he was okay. He was stern but okay. But anyway, uh, we're on our way down the coast and we have radar, search radar, PPI as they call it, plan position indicator. And we had that going. And I was asleep, I didn't have the watch. In fact, I didn't have to have a watch, I was commanding officer, but I did take one because I liked it. And the messenger comes down and said, we're headed on a collision course for the land. He says, come on up. And here it is. We were in the Gulf of Nicoya, and ahead of us there was a light, lighthouse. It had a, We could identify it by its, by its uh, signal, its spacing of the, of the uh, flashing lights, distinguish it from all the, all the fishing boats. So here we are, headed for shore with, with a whole gang of ships. So we uh, rung up the commanding the officer in tactical command and uh, acquainted him of that fact. He didn't have radar. He was one of the unequipped ships. So we changed course and we didn't pile up on the shore. Our reward for that was 24-hour radar watch. <laughs> 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 but it wasn't too long to get to, get to Panama from the Gulf of Nicoya. But we got to Panama and they bring us into the into the into the into the harbor with a good current running through it and told us to wait and left us there until mid afternoon waiting for our turn to go through and waiting for a pilot and finally the order comes down to us individually proceed into the locks and through the canal no pilot well, we'd been maneuvering. We'd had special sea detail on all that time. You know, the the, the first class guys, the, the the number one officers and men for all those positions to be alert. And here we are going through the Panama Canal without a pilot. And needless to say, it was a, both a challenge and a stimulation. And it was great fun. Mm. So we went on through with all those guys still on on duty. I mean, they had a about a twenty hour day. And we got up to the other side, up in the lake, or waiting to get in the in the in the, uh, in the locks. And finally, they signaled us to enter the locks. And there was a Honduran banana boat already in the lock, just ahead of us. So we eased into the into the lock. And I call for re reverse all engines to stop us, just short of the boat, you know. Mm -hmm. And in the confusion, somebody along the way gave us all. A head full, mm -mm. so it was like st standing on the accelerator while you're easing into a parking place. So uh, we reversed that order and also steered for the steered for the side of the lock and managed to snubber down without hitting the, the banana boat. Heard a lot of fast Spanish, <laughs> but we got in. We got down to Coco Solo, or is it Panama? Coco Solo, and. Uh, docked and our orders were changed. We weren't going to New Orleans, we weren't going to Big Easy, we weren't going to have a fancy nice time at at leave and all of that. We were ordered to set out at dawn with no shore leave for Galveston, Texas. Mm. Well there was a certain amount of resentment over that. It was like having being offered a a trip to I don't know, New Orleans and being sent to Tolono. 
<laughs> but that is unfair. I shouldn't have said that. But anyway, off we went. And it just turned out that, and alone, which meant that I had to find my way to Galveston with my little sextant. The only time that ever happened, a high point in my life. Well, the next evening, mid afternoon, late afternoon, we arrived at Old Providence Island, Vieja Providencia, which is a Colombian island, Colombian possession in the Caribbean Sea, north of Panama. And I decided, what the heck? Our guys need some shore leave. So we'll just stop here. So we take the chart. The chart was one of the charts that we had inherited from the British Navy. It had been made by a British naval vessel that had been wrecked there in the early 1800s. Cool. And that's how they occupied themselves until somebody came around to rescue them. It's at the bottom it said, caution, coral may have grown as much as two feet. Whoops. We had a very shallow draft, five feet, and the southern entrance to the, the harbor had 10 feet, supposedly. So we came in that way to the consternation of the people on shore. Here's this big ship coming in this passage with no water, and they came out screaming at us. And as a matter of fact, we did sort of scrape a little bit of coral on the way in. Oops. But we came in and flipped down the anchor, and all of these lowland, uh, Spanish-speaking uh, Caribbeans, African Americans, if you want to call Afro, Afro Colombians, came out in their canoes, and we sent everybody but a skeleton crew ashore, and it came in and was ushered up to the the seat of power, which was right out of Somerset, Mom. It was a a wattle shack with with a with a balcony and a and a thatched roof and a portly Spanish-speaking Colombian who was the governor and some other people. And we sat there drinking cold rum drinks while the, the guys went around town and had their fun and rotated. And the next morning, we went out through the, the proper entrance. Well, it was a big thing for the Vieja Providencians because it was the only U.S. naval vessel that ever actually came in. Huh. Uh, actually, Franklin Roosevelt had come in on a launch and circled around the harbor and gone out when, when his cruiser went by one time. But, so we did that. and we, So I set a, a beeline course for, for uh, Galveston. Uh, right across uh, a coral-strewn sea, the so-called Quita Sueña Banks, no sleep banks, poorly charted, depths presumably enough for us to get by, and there were there was enough water. It was a very foolhardy thing to do. If I'd been a competent naval officer, I wouldn't have done that. But I went on across there, and the first landfall was Swan Island. Missed it, didn't see Swan Island, which isn't too difficult because Swan Island is a very low island, and we were only 32 feet off the water. We can only the horizon was only about just a less than 10 miles out, so if we, and our navigation wasn't that sharp. Went th between Cuba and Yucatan, well out to sea and didn't see him. Sailed across the Gulf of Mexico, not seeing a thing, till finally a buoy appeared. <laughs> and guess what? It was the Galveston Sea Buoy. <laughs> so either this amateur pulled <laughs> off a coup or there was a lot of compensating error along the way. You can take your choice. <laughs> So we come up on the on the harbor, and it was blowing, and uh, we started in, and we were told to anchor and wait, and we didn't hear them. So we we had lots of engines, and we could always back into the wind, and we bulled our way into the harbor, turned and went along the, the docks, and bulled our way into the dock with, without doing any damage at all, and we got in. The next day, they sent us up the Houston Ship Canal to be decommissioned, tied up at the dock. And we made a ceremony out of it. Everybody got up in their dress whites, and we lined up on the deck, and we read the orders and saluted and hauled down the flag, called down the commission pennant, the one that, you, that you're, you're seeing there, 
and the ship was decommissioned, and that was the end of my sea duty in the U.S. Navy. I had orders to report to New Orleans for decommissioning, hopped on a train, went over to New Orleans, went into the naval base, was there for a few days, uh, went over to see the, see the town, saw the French Quarter, Canal Street, and all that. I was challenged by a, a street purveyor of raw oysters. They had a counter up there when they were splitting the oysters and serving them out, and I was sort of watching that like that, and the guy <laughs> says, I'll give you one if you'll eat it. <laughs> so that was the first time I ate raw oysters, and I've been partial to them ever since. I haven't had hepatitis yet. Uh, waiters tell me, okay, are you sure you want raw oysters? Will you sign this? <laughs> but anyway, that's that was that. And I then got decommissioned, got my papers, got my train ticket home, went on up to Tulsa on the railroad, came home, and I'd served three years and five days on active duty. So it's, that gave me four years of GI Bill, which saw me through to my PhD. Oh. I had five days left when I used up the last of it. And it was all in all a good deal, a good deal. And I guess maybe that's about all I can dredge up to talk to you now. I'll think of more after we've left, but I apologize for not being as as uh, quick-witted as I was yesterday, but apparently the clock's running down. Okay. How emotional was you had been on that ship? You're in, when you when you passed the ship on to the Russians as part of the Lend-Lease, That was the ship you had been on throughout that part of your career. How emotional was that moment to leave that ship? Was it a a sad moment or? No, it wasn't. Uh, It wasn't really sad. Uh, th that ship is in my memory, as you can well see. So is the other one. The guys, some of those men, were like I, like me, were plank plank owners. Had been in, so I was with that ship for its entire career, exactly, and uh, until it went into the Russian Navy, and I found out about what happened to it. And I, I, I can, I can, you know, draw an X on it and say, here's. Rest in peace. You you were you were take, stricken from the list on such and such a day. I don't know whether you were melted down or whether you ultimately ended up in the hands of the CIA invading Cuba. Hmm. You didn't because that was a subsequent class. From the pictures I've seen of those ships, they were round con bow door types, which succeeded ours. But uh, no, it wasn't emotional. I, I'm attached to those people. I'm still in communication with them. They. Uh, They helped me with putting together this book. I wrote it seated in front of a yellow pad while my wife was sleeping until noon on a cruise to Acapulco, or not Acapulco, Puerto Vallarta. But most of it wrote it out. It was all garbled. Then I got got the uh, got the ship's log and straightened it out on time. Then I typed it up and I sent it off to these guys, those of them that I knew of, and they edited it and gave me further further stuff, and it's been going back and forth. There's a fellow named John Cox, who was a signalman, lives in Oregon. He's a farmer, a rancher. There's Buswell, who became a dentist and uh, had a career in Ogden, Utah. I don't remember the name of the town now. And uh, was something of a figure in the in the Mormon church. And the fellow named McLeese, who lives in Iowa, is a farmer. Lost track of him. I haven't been getting answers from him lately. There was a fellow who was a bosun's mate, name escapes me at the moment, who was in on it in the early stages of it and then passed away. And then Alan Hamilton, who sent me copies of all those photos he took on the way up to Alaska, but apparently wants to forget about having been in the Navy. I don't get answers. I've, I get answers from him on other things. I mean, we became corresponding friends, but. He's not interested particularly in LCI. LCIs are the Navy. So those people are important. They corroborate the stories. Uh, they don't necessarily corroborate all of them. They're the one about the Senegalese prostitutes, for example, that did not happen to us. It's one of those tricks of memory. But uh, they're there. And the, you don't have that book here, do you? 
It may be here, but... Well, anyway, the uh, little quote in the front of it is a quotation from the, the guy that wrote the, the, the story of the conquest of Mexico, the only uh, full, full A to Z account of it. Wrote it in his 80s while he was a rancher in Guatemala and indignantly announces that he's setting this down because others who were not there are <laughs> telling stories that just aren't true. <laughs> so that's, that's, that's what you read when you, if, you, if you ever pick up the book, that'll be on the, on the fly page. <laughs> now, we know that those stories, your recall is not perfect. And you, you remember things that you were told about as having been there. And you remember details that aren't there. It tends to be glamorized. Things that are either horrible or very pleasant get come to the forefront, and the details get lost. And it's a real effort, a real effort, to try to put down a quote true account without exaggerations and, and a comp true and complete account. And this thing that that I've written isn't going to be such. And I submit that no history book is such. There are techniques and tools of scholarship that enable you to be reasonably accurate. For example, you can get original documents like the log, ship's log. You can get combat reports and so on. And I've got some of those. And you can flesh it out that way and you can co correct and corroborate those. But it's, it is as you see it. And there's a responsibility there which I hope I'm discharging. I would think there are too many areas where there aren't people such as you who are putting down these histories while they still have the memories to write them down. Well, there are a lot of them. Uh, I understand there are 60 people submitting to these interviews, so that's a, a lot of them. There are, there's the oral history project that's been run by the Naval, Naval Institute, which deals mostly with more senior people, people in positions of big responsibility. Most of the admirals have, have done that. There are a myriad of, of memoirs like mine of varying degrees of, of reliability and, and editorial polish and so on. You can find them on the internet. You get the whole thing. I was reading one last night, a guy that <laughs> evangelical preacher. He's mostly talking about his preaching career, but he does talk about his, there are too few paragraphs about his naval career. And they're out there. And that's sort of, these things, the thing that you're doing here, we're doing here, in a sense is, is, is the raw material from which professional, scholarly, I use, put that in quotation mark, historians will compose their monographs, some of which will be readable, which will be popularizations, which will be less reliable, and some of which will be so, so detailed and so thorough that nobody but another historian will be willing to read them, except somebody that's, that's working up policy. People that work up policy for the government ought to be reading history. If some of them had been a little bit closer to the closer to that, we might not be in some of the messes that we find ourselves right now. Well, that might be a very nice closing note for our interview. We have been talking to Ralph Langenheim as part of the Veterans History Project of the Library of Congress, American Folk Life Center at Studio X, WILL-TV, Campbell Hall, Urbana, Illinois. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Oh, good grief. That's that cliche that everybody That's has interviewed excellent. on That's TV. Excellent. <laughs> it has been a pleasure from my perspective. Are we still on the, on the air? <laughs> I better not say what I w really wanted to say. <laughs>